Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us. This is the second of our trilogy for Ready or Not, Here They Come. Um, this was just an initiative um, that Tomahawk came up with um, basically 24 hours um, after we all had the wonderful news that we have confirmed border opening dates, something that we had all been waiting for for so long. Um, so this was just something we wanted to do to go, okay, how can Tomahawk help all of us um, get prepared? Um, and we looked at three different subjects that we were getting the most questions about. So we were getting the most questions about how to find staff, how to be digitally um, prepared, and then next week is the third and final one with the third category everybody keeps talking about is, so we're, our borders are open, how do we welcome people back? How do we make sure our team is safe? How do we make sure our guests are safe? And what do we need to do differently? So that's next week's one. So thank you for joining us. We hope you get value out of this. And we have Dave on board, so fantastic. We've got all of our speakers here today. So let me start off by saying thank you very, very much to our three speakers um, who are very generously donating their time um, to share their insights today. Um, we have Renee Goodsell, the head of um, digital here at Tomahawk. We have Trevor Topfer, who is head of marketing at Otterfish, which you guys, if you haven't heard about Otterfish, will learn all about. And the amazing, if anybody in tourism doesn't know, Dave Simmons, um, who has had an illustrious career in tourism. Too many, too many for me to name. Um, you make me sound like an old dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm still the oldest one on the call, so you're a youngie. Um, but your current role right now and why we even invited you for your insights is you're the strategic manager um, at Juicy and Juicy's Cut both um, an operation in New Zealand and Australia. So we thought there might be some great stuff that you can share with us today. So thank you to our invited guests. Thank you to all of you. Hi, Raima, I just saw a wave. Um, and what I would like to start out with today, you guys, before we get straight on to the subject, is a little bit of good news that I've had, um, we've probably all had a lot of pleasure reading lately. And that is a lot of reports that have been coming out. A lot of reports that have been coming out, whether it's from SCIFT, S-K-I-F-T, if you don't um, follow SCIFT, please do. Um, from SCIFT, um, Expedia is doing a lot of reports, Forward Keys, which is a metadata um, um, aggregator um, across tourism. They've all been coming out with quite a few reports lately, and it has been really positive. Now, forgive me while I read these, but I want to get the numbers right. So um, according to Forward Keys, that's a data aggregator, you guys, across all sorts of internationally. And what they're seeing is a really great recovery already for those countries who have opened their borders. And so for example, India, who's done a great job really announcing and being clear about their border openings and um, restrictions or lack of restrictions, they have recovered 80% of their 2019 numbers already. Um, which is fantastic. Closer to home, Fiji's already seeing a recovery of forward bookings of 61% of their 2019 bookings. Amazing, right? Australia's already got forward bookings enough of, oh, I didn't say that very well. Their forward bookings show 38% um, recovery from the 2019 numbers. So when the borders open, it's not gonna be a giant boom, but what we're seeing is huge intent from travelers and forward booking, yeah? So I say that's fantastic news for us. Um, Expedia just released their big report. Um, they did um, one of the largest, largest pieces of research out there. And they're showing 81% of travelers are planning to take a leisure trip in the next six months. And one in five, that's 20% are gonna be taking more than, 20% are gonna take three or more. So these are the kind of things, these are the kind of good news things that, you know, we can all start looking forward to. Um, I am going to start this after that little thing. I am going to start everybody with a little question before we get to our speakers. So let's use that chat box down below. 
Everybody knows where chat is. We've been using Zoom now for two years. On a scale from one to 10, I'd like to do a little pulse. And how about you guys share? If 10 is optimistic and you're seeing great, strong forward booking, are you feeling optimistic? Give us a 10. If you're seeing some light, yeah, and some forward booking, I don't know, choose. Give us a six or a seven. And if you're not feeling very good and you're not seeing um, a lot of forward bookings, you can go in the lower end. So while you guys um, hit that chat and let's see how people are feeling. Are we feeling optimistic? Are we seeing strong forward bookings or not? Um, we'll get started. And then in between speakers, um, we'll share those results. Yeah. I think good? through thick and fast now, Gina. Yeah. Yeah. Like a pretty solid seven, eight. Yeah. Seven and a half, eight, which is awesome. Fantastic to see. That's super. Whoa, it is coming in thick and fast. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. We are seeing higher numbers. That's great. We'll do a little rolling average. Um, um, shortly. Is your voice that better is John sitting next to you? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's had their coffee this morning. Yeah. They're all quick to go. You know? like, so, oh, okay. I've been off coffee for 12 days now, so I can't do the calculation. <laughs> what 12 all days right. the coffee would be like. <laughs> I don't need it, so I can't join you with that one. <laughs> so look at, let's start off. We all know there's five stages of travel. And we know the first stage of travel is dreaming, right? And we know there's a lot of dreaming going on. So let's start off with you, Trevor. You live in the world of social media all day. Um, this has been your background for many, many years and you're part of this new amazing Kiwi venture called Otterfish, mm. which um, we'll do a little spotlight on in our newsletter. Um, so tell me this, what are you seeing differently in social now as compared to BC before coronavirus? Are you seeing anything different? I wonder if that, that language is going to be adopted, Gina, and we're going to go back into a new, you know, year zero BC um, or, or AC. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that lockdowns precipitated a lot more activity online. So almost every digital platform, metric, uh, provider, channel all got an uptick, massive uptick in, uh, in the amount of uh, attention and the amount of time spent on those platforms. So uh, to offset that, a lot of the physical channels shut down significantly. So there was a lot less investment in uh, advertising spend, marketing spend, promotional spend in outside of digital. So with all that money coming in and all that attention coming in, things became a lot more competitive, a lot more expensive and a lot more crowded. So. Uh, so those are the, uh, uh, that's the big change is it, it, it's now become a much more competitive and expensive environment. And so you need to be a lot more strategic about how you play in that space in order to get the most value out of that, out of those channels, because the, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, you, you, you almost can't grow a business anymore without investing in those channels. That's where everybody is. And you're really making it hard for yourself if you're not playing in that field, but it's how you go about doing it. Um, the other big uh, things that have emerged is we've had a, a, a very big winner in TikTok. So TikTok went from, in 2019, they were at half a billion monthly active users. They're now over a billion monthly active users. So they've doubled at enormous scale in the last 18 to 24. And so with everybody sort of heading onto that platform, that type of content has become very, very important too. Uh, so we saw Facebook respond by promoting the organic reach of things like uh, Reels. We saw YouTube roll out a new product called Shorts, which is the same type of content but on their platform. I believe LinkedIn are also toying with a few early stage um, products in that same vein. So this idea of going from landscape to portrait has become a really, really big change in the whole content landscape. So that is, okay, there was, I just wrote down so much. That was amazing. So, so one of the changes that people um, need to be aware of is that before we were always talking about landscape and big and dreamy. So now we're looking at video that's portrait. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about video, um, but 
TikTok is just also extended the length of their videos. So are, are you seeing anything there in regards to what was normally shorts, you know, reels and short? Is it is video getting longer on social media? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it plays to the, the algorithms and the goals. If you think about it, if you are Facebook or TikTok, your ultimate metric is time spent on platform, right? So you want to maximize the amount of time that people are spending on platform. So if there's content that's keeping people engaged and keeping them on platform, you're going to reward that content. So they've got a bunch of little metrics in place that trigger the algorithm to say, hey, this is content that's engaging people. It's keeping them on the platform. So these new metrics, like things like dwell time is, is one of these ones that I've Oh heard. my God, is that why all the videos go, wait till the end now? Yeah, yeah. You know? and, then, and you get these crazy videos <laughs> where it could have been done in 10 or 20 seconds and it's now <laughs> stretched out over 10 minutes and it's boring as hell, but you've got this sort of, uh, you know, one of these clever marketing tactics where they open up a curiosity gap. So you immediately, you see the video and you go, oh, I want to know what the answer or the end of this is. And then you uh, sit there for ages and ages watching mindlessness. And you, and think, so you oh get gosh, that, 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 that curiosity life, I'm never getting back from it. <laughs> yeah, so, see, so, so the short answer is yes. Nodding his head. Dave, have you, have you had experience in this already? Uh, we, we've been playing around with all sorts of different content, but, um, and it's, it's definitely a different environment, right? In terms of some things work, some things don't, but we're just constantly testing and learning. So if I'm nodding, I'm kind of nodding on the basis that, yeah, some of those things we've been trialing, we certainly haven't cracked it in any way, shape or form. We're still very much on the learning curve. Oh my gosh, that is such the perfect lead in and this wasn't even planned for my next question. <laughs> because with so much noise on social media, how, and so much competition and the price is going up, how do we cut through the noise and how do we test content so it works? So we're not wasting money, Trevor. Yeah, uh, really, really good question. And the answer is probably not gonna sit tremendously well with everybody, but the, the stark reality is these platforms have gotten expensive and attention has gotten much more expensive. And so you kind of got to pay to play now. Um, there are still some organic opportunities. And again, back to TikTok, back to Reels, these portrait um, content, forms are still getting a lot of organic reach. I mean, I, for example, with Otterfish have recently uh, invested in a resource. So I've now got a guy that makes my TikTok video. So it takes a podcast or a webinar like this, finds the little moments, the little sound bites, the little important bits and generates it and produces it in TikTok worthy with lots of fancy transitions and lots of movement and excitement. So he optimizes that piece of content for TikTok and I'm getting more than 10,000 views on one of those videos, whereas I before was getting hundreds, maybe thousands if I was lucky, just by editing the, the video and optimizing it for that channel, I'm getting a lot more organic reach. So there are still organic reach opportunities, but the stark reality is we now need to pay and test and you know, uh, pay to amplify and understand what's working. So, uh, which is very fortunate for us at Otterfish because that's what our tool does but it's actually a, a trend whether you use Otterfish or you, or, or you do it directly into the platforms or use another tool. The idea of testing everything, so testing your messaging, testing your images, testing your calls to action, testing your headlines, testing different audience segments and breaking up your audience and looking for opportunities within those audiences and spending a little bit of money, get a little bit of data and make a decision. Uh, you know, we're almost gone are the days and if you're still in this sort of mindset where you build a campaign and you go this is going to be our campaign for the next month two months three months this is the message this is the market this is the spend off we go it's you're just throwing that money away to a large extent or you're rolling the dice and hoping that you 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 happen to luckily get it right uh but if you're not testing and then trying to understand this stuff how do you even know if you got it right like you might be happy with those results but you with a bit of testing you might have been able to massively improve those results and get even more from that spend so testing has, has become very very important wow the other thing which is not related to testing and spending a little bit of money which i'm sure we're going to get into more um, another kind of organic but a hard work one of these earned channels so in marketing we speak about paid earned and owned so one of these earned channels that I, i'm very excited about is facebook groups and i think it's really relevant for this audience so midway through the pandemic facebook turned around and said hey we're meta and uh and whilst most people sort of went yeah good on you that's a great marketing ploy you 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 got our interest for about five minutes. It doesn't mean anything to me. And we move on and I go back to opening up Facebook. 
what that what they did was they signaled that the future of that business and the future of the platforms that that business owns is going to be in the metaverse. And the other thing that they very quietly have gone about doing is elevating the so uh, the the reach and what's over indexing, I should say, are Facebook groups. So the metaverse lends itself to more immersive environments like we're in right now so if you imagine this in a kind of metaverse environment we would all be much closer and more engaged and it would be this sort of much more uh, immersive almost three-dimensional experience what facebook's leaning towards to transition themselves into that world is facebook groups so you're almost better to post in a group now than you are on your own page mm. you'll get more reach from that message you'll get more eyeballs on that message if it's within a group so join groups that are relevant to your business product service whatever but more importantly create groups that's so interesting, Trevor, because we've actually been doing that for some customers, especially um, uh, accommodation providers that want to talk to um, overseas agents. We're actually they're actually creating agent groups where they can talk to them directly and open that. So that's fantastic that you yeah, it, that you brought that up. Yeah, you've got to look at it like it's like you're building an email database list, right? You've got to plot away, get the right people in there, keep them engaged. But once you open up that channel. You own it, you can promote and market to that group. And then when we move into this sort of Web3 metaverse, you're kind of preparing yourself uh, for that transition as well. I'm, I'm feeling like another webinar needs to be done. Let's do the next one on, <laughs> on how to use Facebook groups for your for your tourism business. What do we think, Dave? <laughs> I've got lots to learn. I'd, I'd be uh, sitting there listening for sure. Okay, cool. Hey, Trevor, I, there's no doubt we can talk about social and, and what it can do for us which is the dreaming stage um, for a long time because there's so many changes. Um, but let's move on to the big beast, um, Googleopoly. Um, I'm not supposed to say that, but I do. Um, so Renee, mm -hmm. as a Google guru, um, what trends are you seeing? What are you seeing internationally? And then what are you seeing just for New Zealand? Yeah, definitely. It's really interesting because um, as part of prepping for this, but also conversations that we're having with customers um, within our network as well, there's a lot of interest in New Zealand, coming to New Zealand, borders opening, all of that sort of stuff, uh, which is fantastic. But the thing is, is that there's also a lot of interest in people leaving New Zealand. So mm -hmm. looking at going outbound. Um, so how are we balancing that? Because obviously we're all doing really well in that domestic space and have been doing really well in that domestic space for the last 24 months. Um, and people are loving that. But what's it going to mean? And is there a balance? So we're seeing that end of last year, if we were to look at 100 searches or 100, um, yeah, it's 100 searches, 97 of those were New Zealanders looking to travel in their own backyard. Three of them were international coming into New Zealand. We're now seeing interest into New Zealand shift up, which is fantastic. And so we're seeing 11 of those searches. Um, again, just using 100 because it's easy for my head and it's early in the morning. Um, but 11 of those searches would be internationals looking to come into New Zealand. And we're seeing 89 of those still domestically looking to travel around New Zealand. So we're still getting that interest. We've still got people looking to explore their backyard, um, but we're seeing that lift uh, in international. So much so that it's, it peaked at around a 43% lift um, earlier this month which does align really nicely with uh, when the announcements were made, when people were starting to talk about the fact that New Zealand is open. Um, yeah, where we have found a lot of this data and we're happy to share any of these tools and, and prep for this, we were looking at tools that are free, um, how you can find this information as well. So Google have an amazing array of um, trend insight tools, uh, specific to tourism, specific to hotels, um, and then you can go down rabbit holes in that space as well. Yeah, so I think that's really, really important for us to, to, to really highlight with everybody um, here is that, um, in fact, we can put it in the chat and we can even do an entire session on that too, you guys. But Google Travel Insights is a free tool for all of you guys to go to. This is not, you know, don't let anybody tell you that, you know, you, you have to wait for a report. 
um, or pay for that kind of data. Google gives it all to us, okay? And it's one of the things that we're really strong about um, at, at Tomahawk is empowering you with the knowledge. So you can go to Google Travel Trends and you can use filters and you can use it by destination. What are people from Australia, you know, searching and looking, you know, what are the travel trends or the search terms um, looking at New Zealand? What's hot? And you can also then click onto another part and just look at accommodations. Yeah? Maybe that's some that maybe that's another poll. Um, okay, you guys say yes or no. Yes or no, would you guys be interested in a in a session on how to use Google Travel um, Insights Trends? Okay, we got a couple of thumbs up. We've got hands up. Okay, um, put it in the chat because um, it's really important to understand you guys what these trends mean. So again, anything that you do with your precious time, because everybody's working so hard that you're using it in a way that's that's valuable. What do you need to do on your website? knowing what these trends are, right? What do you need to do um, in blog articles to know what um, you should be writing about? Yeah. Is there a topic in that that could be a Facebook group? Is there so much interest in a particular topic on one of those sites that you could build a group about it and start bringing yeah. people into it? Yeah. That's a great way yeah. to put that sort of stuff out. And to your yeah. point as well, Gina, around blog topics, we often get asked, oh my gosh, where do we start writing a blog? Because that's the most overwhelming part. And um, I feel like I'm the free tool giver today, but <laughs> it's not quite Christmas. Um, but another tool that I love, and, and anyone who has worked with me will hear me talk about this tool a lot. It's not a Google tool. I mean, it's called Answer the Public, and you can put a topic into this tool, and it spits out all of this really cool um, information on like how, what, why, when, um, and gives you some nice insights as to what it is that people are actually searching for. Um, so I chucked that in this morning, so I was able to get some fresh um, information. And I am going to refer to my notes because my memory is not that uh, not that flash. Um, but when I looked at travel New Zealand, it's quite a broad um, broad theme. The main part was around travel restrictions. So people are still actively looking and wanting to find what restrictions we do have in play. By all means, not expecting any of you to become experts in that field because we've got experts that have that information. But making sure that on your own website, you've got this information that leads people to the right place to find what it is that they need. So any marketing that you are doing, anything you are doing in social media, um, to get your brand out there, that when they are coming to your website, they're called like, cool, dream check, I'm going to New Zealand. Um, dream check, I'm gonna go and stay at this lodge, but actually can I? And so by you becoming a thought leader or providing that information or a, a path to find that information is gonna be really helpful and give them confidence in the fact that, yeah, you guys know this, you're helping me, you're part of my journey, I do wanna support you. Um, the other really cool thing, so restrictions aside, because that topic can get boring fast. Um, another really cool thing was people were asking still when to travel to New Zealand. So when is it a good time? So making sure that you've got content on your site that talks about the different seasons. If you are in an area that is very seasonal um, and has some really cool autumn colors, beautiful spring, yada, 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 talk about that, put content on your website, share um, content on your social, add it to the group. Um, they're looking for trip ideas, itineraries, planning. Uh, yeah. Dave, you'll like this one, but they were asking about camper vans. That popped up a couple of times. So, um, you know, how can people travel around New Zealand? And then another really cool one, which I loved um, and I think is really important, and especially for anyone who organizes travel for people, um, is that people are searching for traveling to New Zealand and Australia or traveling to New Zealand and the Cook Islands. So we saw this pre-COVID BC that, you know, a lot of people travel to New Zealand and Australia together and they're still looking to do so now. So if you are planning those trips or if you have a sister property or a sister brand or business, Again, uh, Dave, you're front and center because you're on my screen, but um, how do you package or combo the fact that someone might need a rental car in Australia for the first half of their trip 
and then uh, come down to New Zealand and finish their trip and also leverage the Juicy brand as well. So it's about, like Gina and I spoke about at the start of the, all of this, about collaborating, working with each other, talking to operators that you have got um, uh, things in common with so that you're working together, not all trying to fight for the same piece of the pie. Well, that leads perfectly into Dave. <laughs> Dave, the, the nice thing about being the last speaker is that they've all shared all their insights and you get to now share yours and, and really highlight what they've said, seen. So as a, <laughs> as, as a, an amazing strategic brain and as the leader of a company that is in both New Zealand and Australia, what have you learned since Australia has opened that you can share and that you'll be leveraging for New Zealand's opening for your company? That was a big Yeah, really good question, Gina. The, um, you know, the, the one thing I'd start by saying is that, you know, we're, we're at a standing start. If you think of a Formula One race, cars are racing around the track and we're just coming out of the pit stop right now. The, this is the, the, the global tourism market, to your point, Gina, is roaring back into life. Uh, roaring. And, you know, we are at the very end of the queue. You know, we're, yeah. we're at a standing start. Uh, and so, you know, you got to get the hustle kind of thought process and we, we've got to hustle to fight to get market share, to get customers back down here. And we need to be moving hard and fast. Let me give you some insights from Australia. And it was interesting last night just prepping for this um, and it kind of surprised me a little bit. We know that Australia has bounced back strongly from a juicy perspective. We've got cars and campers over there. I looked at um, uh, the same period for, for March point of sale uh, 2019 versus this current month, we're 113% of 2019 currently, 140% on value, right? So Australia has raced back to life uh, in particular markets. Now, some of that value is coming from higher average booking rates. So car hire, for example, has doubled uh, in terms of your average daily rate has doubled. So the market is roaring back into life. And, and you know, the concern I've got from an industry perspective is I think we're all kind of thinking we've got to put our slippers on and start kind of going and get our makeup on and get ready to kind of get prepared. The market is racing, right? And as New Zealand is a destination, we've got to be out there hustling collectively. Otherwise, we'll miss the share of the market that we deserve. Uh, I love that point. you're saying that. And that's why we named this ready or not, here they come. So yeah. whether you're ready or not, they're coming. So I love well, that you let, that. Let me, They're traveling. Let me put it that way, Gina. Yeah. Ready or not, they're traveling. New yeah. Zealand's got to make sure we get our share of the market because yeah. right now we're not out there punching hard enough. And then within that as operators, we've got to make sure we get our share of that as well. So um, it, it's, it's moving super fast. Uh, no shadow of a doubt of that. Again, another interesting insight from the Australian market is lead times. Uh, your average lead time uh, for that same period, two years apart, 14 days two years ago, it's 54 days right now. So we yeah. are beginning to see that European market come back down, making bookings, uh, committing um, for extended periods of time as well. So we're super positive around how that translates across into New Zealand. Um, in terms of what we're doing differently, um, we really have turned things upside down. And uh, I, I kind of smile. Renee's been on the on the end of some of this for the last 18 months or so. But we've been very deliberate about you know, having to think differently about the business. To be honest, I think a lot of tourism businesses pre-COVID, you know, it was it was getting pretty easy, to be honest, right? Um, the last two years has been anything but. And we've had to turn things upside down. And what we, we've done is we started by really understanding our customer, you know, and being really myopic around who is our customer that engages with our brand and our product and really spent some time understanding that and have been very deliberate about how we connect with that customer. And anything else is noise. You know, we got, I had a proposal come through today, re sponsorship. It's like, it's so easy to say no when you're really clear around who your customer is. So that's kind of first bit. And then we, in some ways, and apologies, Trevor, we, we turned the funnel upside down a little bit um, in terms of we, you know, we didn't have the luxury of kind of spending money in terms of at the top of the funnel, in terms of building the pipeline. So we had to get really myopic around 
conversion point, you know, what worked, getting really disciplined around um, your cost of sale, uh, yeah. what channels work for us, which channels don't, um, and which ones convert and which ones don't. So as an example, for car hire, actually it's so much more cost effective for us to lean onto the online travel agencies uh, because it's a flat fee that we pay, right? Whereas if we're playing in the dreaming sort of direct space, let's say, it's all over the show. We don't know from one month to the next in terms of what the cost of sale is going to be in there. So we've been very deliberate about the channels that we've used and really making sure we've got the disciplines in place around what we're spending is then converting into dollars in the tin. We haven't had the luxury, and you know, no tourism business has, has had the luxury of you know, being able to spend money without real confidence is going to convert into, if you spend a dollar, you're going to get $2 back. So we've got right back to those sort of basics of being you know, treasuring every dollar we're spending. And as we start stepping forward, we're starting to step up that funnel a little bit. So instead of starting at the top and hoping like heck it comes through, we turned it up the other way and made sure that what we were doing was converting and we'll now start to build up that funnel uh, as we go up, which is, has been probably a little bit of a different approach. And, and I, the other message I have in there is, really embracing all distribution channels and thinking of them in an integrated way, um, as opposed to simply kind of direct or trade, which a lot of businesses do, right? And mm. you know, one of the things which I've annoyed the Tomahawk team was, is just getting consistency of language, right? So in the online space, you typically tend to you know, talk about cost of acquisition or uh, mm -hmm. your return on ad spend. Well, that doesn't typically kind of correlate with a, a, a traditional operator that thinks around cost of sale, you know, what's the commission we're paying to agents. So we just have aligned all that up. We talk about cost of sale, whether it's a trade channel or a, an online travel agent or a wholesale channel. So we really understand what the cost of getting that product to customer is and we can make an informed decision around uh, what's the most sensible channel to, to move that product out to the customer. And sometimes as I say, it will be through, a, through an OTA, sometimes it will be through our wholesale partners great news is actually we're doing great stuff direct as well so we're, we're doing some uh, getting some good business growing there um yeah so those think, are kind of key key pieces there Gina. that is just so valuable because don't you think that this is i i, I say this tongue in cheek that's one of the gifts that COVID has given us yeah is that we had to take a pause and get smarter about how we were doing business um and so many tourism businesses don't look at their cost of sale um, they don't, they think, okay, I pay a wholesaler this, I pay um, um, an, an OTA this, um, I pay this much for marketing, but what are you willing to spend in order to acquire um, a customer? And because, as you said, they were coming in before, so we didn't really think about it. Well, um, the mistake I think most businesses make, uh, uh, Gina, is they'll, they'll think about their kind of direct marketing cost as a marketing cost. Yeah. And it'll be, you'll have a monthly budget that will say, we're going to spend 5,000 or 10,000 or 1,000 or whatever the case might be on marketing, right? Um, whereas actually, when you think of that as a cost of sale, if you can get your measurement right, you move it up above the line as a cost of sale. And as, as I say to kind of Renee and the, the Tomahawk team, I don't care how much you spend on Google AdWords, so long as it's sitting at sort of less than 15% cost of sale, keep yeah. going. If you spend 30,000 or 50,000, I don't care. But yeah. Moving that from being a budget line, yeah, where you go, we can't spend more than five thousand because it's in our budget line. Um, that would be like saying we can only spend five thousand on travel agents, and when they you know, hit that, we go, don't sell anymore. No one. Yeah. Knows. <laughs> That's a very good analogy. That's a really, really good yeah. analogy. Hey, there's no doubt that we could talk about this for a long time. What I want to do is I'm gonna continue the conversation, but I wanna give everybody um, on the, the webinar today the opportunity um, for two things. Number one, you guys, we've popped the link to, to the Google Travel Insights in the chat. Feel free to look at it yourself, um, but I also see that some of you guys would like some insights on how to use that and how to understand it better. So we'll have a look at that. But let's use that chat right now too. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions that you would love to ask about Google, about social, um, Dave's amazing strategic brain and what the, he's doing. Um, and while those are coming in, I am going to ask another question. So Trevor, um, in a couple of minutes, um, you brought up the old TikTok, which a lot of people have been going, oh, that's just for dancing. Um, this, it's not a business platform. Um, 
are you seeing conversions? Are you seeing anybody in tourism that's doing it well? Do you think, Renee's gonna bring up Pinterest, I can tell you right now when I open up this question. Are you seeing any other platforms, Pinterest, Clubhouse that should be used? And that's to Trevor, Renee and Dave. Do you guys have, can you guys approach that? Trevor first. Uh, sure. So the answer is yes. I mean, you've got a billion monthly active users on the platform. So your customers are on the platform. It's as simple as that. It's about figuring out how to, how that content type, and there is definitely a specific type of content on that platform, how that translates to you telling your story. Um, you know, Dave brought up a really, really important point, which I, which I was hoping to get to, but I know we're under time restraint, which is all about understanding your customer or, or your key personas. So really, really becoming clear on who those personas are that you're targeting. And as he says, ignore the rest of it as noise. And if you understand who those people are that you're targeting, you can then look at what's the type of content on that platform that those people are consuming and how do, how do I make my, or how do I tell my story through that lens? Yeah. Let me, let me make a comment that we often say, um, because when we were only marketing to Kiwis, to the domestic traveler, um, we would often have people say, oh, so I want to market to Kiwis. And we're like, yes, but who, which Kiwis, where, right? And that goes to Dave's conversation about being myopic. And they're just like, all Kiwis. Um, and so we would, challenge, yeah, we would challenge them and we're like, okay, do you want to go tell somebody in Invercargill that they're just like an Aucklander? Because you can stand back for that reaction. <laughs> um, so it is really about understanding your customer. So thank you. Um, looking Renee, for, sorry, Gina, uh, looking for what the, what are the key parts of that persona that you can target, right? So it's not just, uh, they're, they, you know, they drink coffee in the morning or they live in Auckland, they live in this region, whatever. What are the key things? Are there, is your experience or your service a higher uh, priced item that requires a higher income earner to participate in? And how do you identify a higher income earner? On, uh, on a marketing or, or audience targeting thing? Is it education? Is it their job title? You know, what are the sorts of things that can really uh, help you define, and, and, and Dave's exactly right, going really myopic, going really, really deep on that. And you start to understand, these are the people that I want to get. And when you understand exactly who they are, the ones that shift the needle, you can build your message, your content, your campaign, your journey, everything, every part of the, every touch point that you go through with those particular customers, tailored specifically to answer the questions, problems, challenges that those people have. Content's just a vehicle. TikTok's just a place. It's, it's, it's not a, do you know what I mean? Like it's just a place where those people are. It's about speaking and answering and addressing the problems, challenges, goals, et cetera, of the particular persona. And, and the reason why this is so important and the reason why we want to talk about it today is because there is so much noise, um, is what we call it, um, out there. And there's so many um, destinations that are open now and with noise. And as New Zealand, We've got Tourism New Zealand doing advertising. We have our RTOs doing advertising. We have our individuals doing advertising. So this is what we just wanted to share with all of you on how you as a business owner, um, some tips and tricks on how you can hopefully cut through the noise and find your customers. Um, look at, we're running out of time. We have five minutes left. We're gonna do a quick fire. Um, Renee, I'm gonna start with you. Um, if each of our speakers could leave our um, participants today with one piece of advice to remember. Renee, what would your one piece of advice be? Uh, put people at the core, whether it's your audience, whether it's your team, whether it's um, your customer, make sure that you're thinking of them at any given time when you're doing marketing. Dave? I've just made up an acronym, I think, uh, um, Gina, to... Um, we don't have enough of those in our industry. Give us another one. CTM, customer, test, and measure. There you go. Ooh. Know your customer, test and learn, and measure, measure, measure. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Ooh. I, I think he might have stole yours, Trevor. Did you guys um, talk about as a, as a As a, the head of marketing for a testing platform, I obviously <laughs> agree with that, test and measure. But I think it's also... Uh, 
you know, there's been a massive investment in data um, from big business right down to small business operators. It's now achievable to, to, to get data, analyze data and understand data, but what's important, and Dave was very, uh, again, singing your praises a lot, Dave, you seem to have dropped some genius here, mate, uh, but that understanding of um, CPA or cost per acquisition is an important one. I think the other one to throw in the mix, which is my parting thought is, understand what your average customer lifetime value is. If you don't understand what your average you. customer lifetime value is, you don't know how much you can afford to pay to acquire a new customer. Yeah. If they, you know, you might have a, and a lot of people get that wrong because they look in a 12 month window and they say, oh, my customers spend $1,000 a year. Well, what if they last for five years? That's $5,000 that an average customer is worth to you. And you might be able to spend a hell of a lot more than you realize well, acquiring one of those customers. So it's definitely that, a number we need to be talking about. You have yeah. goals to achieve, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a customer, I mean, a number we should be talking about across tourism. Um, but that's for another day. Hey, um, thank you to everybody um, who joined us today. Thank you very much to Dave Simmons, Trevor, Renee, for um, sharing all your knowledge and experience. Everybody, we will be doing a little two minute highlights reel and the full recording for you. We will let you go um, onto the rest of your beautiful day. Hopefully we see you next week about how to um, welcome guests safely. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. let's share that we're open you guys. Let's start making as much noise out there that New Zealand's ready to um, share our beautiful country with people again. So kia ora. Thank you very, very much. Cheers, everybody.